Hello and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. We've been taking a slow trip through Exodus chapter 4, looking at some of the details that I think will help us understand one of the strangest passages in the whole book. So today we're going to pick up with verse 25 and verse 26. Um, If you are just joining us for this video, you're going to want to pause this and go back and watch the previous five because they Uh, build a a case step by step for what I'm about to share. All right, we'll still be here when you get back. Okay, here's how I translate verses 25 and 26. But Zipporah took flint and cut the foreskin of her son, and she made it touch his feet. Then she said, you are my blood relative. So he drew back from him when she said blood relative because of the circumcisions. Now you'll notice if you're following along in another English translation, that there is some ambiguity to my translation. Um, In places where the NIV supplies Moses or Yahweh or whatever, I've just said he, and I'm following the Hebrew very closely here, there's a lot of ambiguity in this text. Who is doing what to whom? Not to mention why are they doing it? Lots of questions. Um, Let me see if I can make a case for what's, what's happening in these couple of verses. So the first question I have is, why is Gershom not circumcised? Gershom is the the oldest son of Moses, and it seems to be that's who Zipporah is circumcising. She cut the foreskin of her son. Um, Why would he not be circumcised? If if Moses is a Hebrew, then this is step one. Uh, Circumcision is the single command that God gives to Abraham in Genesis 17. It's the only thing he asks of the covenant family is to circumcise their sons. Moses is not going to be able to lead the people if he has not obeyed the one command God has already given. So we have a problem here. Moses is in, is not in compliance. Now, my next question is, how does Zipporah know what to do? Yahweh meets Moses and tries to kill him or is about to kill him, and somehow Zipporah realizes that circumcision is what we need right now. Um, it's so mysterious. It's such a strange passage. I'm not really sure how she knows what to do, but here are a few things to consider. One, she's from a priestly family. She is the daughter of the priest of Midian, so perhaps ritual is native to her. Maybe she and Moses have talked about this before. Um, I'm not sure, but when she does the act, she also makes a statement, you are my blood relative, And that statement seems to be a ritually efficacious statement, like she's she's pronouncing, like uh, this might be similar to what happens in a wedding ceremony when the the officiant says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Like that statement makes the marriage actually a thing. And so here she's making a statement that puts into effect what she's trying to accomplish. You are my blood relative. What she's announcing seems to be kinship with the covenant family. She recognizes that their status as members of the covenant family is in question. She's Midianite. He was raised by Egyptians, but has married a Midianite. They're returning to enter into the community of the Hebrew family, the descendants of Abraham. But if their own sons haven't been circumcised, then they haven't actually signed on yet. And that's going to be a problem. Um, In chapter 12, when we get to chapter 12 with the Passover instructions, we'll find that no uncircumcised male is allowed to participate in the Passover. The Passover is the feast that commemorates and and precedes and commemorates the actual Exodus. So Moses can't be going back to Egypt to lead the people out and to celebrate a ritual of God's deliverance if he's not in compliance with the basic requirement of covenant membership. All right, so another question we have is whose feet did she touch? And are these feet or are these feet? So it says Zipporah took flint and cut the foreskin of her son and she made it touch his feet, but it doesn't tell us whose feet. Is this Gershom's feet, the feet of her son? Is this the feet of Moses? Is this the feet of Yahweh? or the angel of Yahweh, as some um, manuscripts have it. It's not, it's not very clear. If it's Yahweh's feet, then the idea is that 
um, she's like giving a, a blood sacrifice kind of. She's she's giving the the bloody foreskin as a sign of her compliance. I'm personally intrigued by the possibility that this is Moses' feet and that she's not actually talking about feet. It's talking about uh, male body parts. Um, there is precedent in the Hebrew Bible for using feet as a polite conversational way to talk about the male uh, sex organ. And so you can find that in Deuteronomy 28, verse 57, as well as Isaiah 6, verse 2, or Isaiah 7, verse 20. Those are all places where feet probably refers to genitalia, not to actual feet. So it's possible that what, what Zipporah is doing is she circumcises the son, but then she touches Moses' naked body with the foreskin. And that might be why we have a plural reference to circumcisions in verse 26. So he drew back from him when she said blood relative because of the circumcisions. Why do I think that? Well, Moses may not have been circumcised as a Hebrew baby. I'm thinking if I'm a mom trying to protect my child from discovery by Pharaoh and his, uh, and his officials because they're going to kill him, that I probably won't be performing an elective surgery uh, that would give away our location, right? That, or the fact that there's a baby in the house. I would want to keep him from crying uh, at all costs. So it's possible that Moses wasn't circumcised and that he goes to the palace uncircumcised. I, I can't prove it, but it's, I'm just saying it's possible. Um, and then it's possible that he would have undergone the normal Egyptian circumcision, which happened at puberty. So he's around 13 years old and he would undergo Egyptian circumcision um, it's thought that Egyptians circumcised for hygienic reasons, um, that they didn't remove the entire foreskin, but just slit it. Uh, and so it's possible that Moses has been marked on his body. But if it was Egyptian circumcision, then it's irrelevant to covenant status and covenant membership. So it might be that Zipporah is here circumcising the son, but by touching um, Moses with it and by announcing that they've become kin with Yahweh, that they, they've become blood relatives, that she's um, kind of reactivating or re-signifying his circumcision. Now it signifies covenant membership. It's possible. I'm, I'm partly speculating, um, but we don't know. There are gaps in the story. So um, the, the main idea is that the uncertainty of their covenant status has got to be resolved before they get back to Egypt because Yahweh has already announced his intention to kill the firstborn of Egypt. And so they have to come back like very squarely in the covenant community. Um, and without that, they're in danger. There's one more thing I want to say about this passage, and this has already been long, so thanks for sticking with me. Um, I think it's really fun that here in chapter four, we have a woman who delivers Moses from death. And if you watched the early videos, or if you've seen my chapter on Freedom Fighters of the Exodus that I wrote for the biblical world of gender, then you know that women have done a lot of saving already in this book. We have the daughter of Levi, the daughter of Pharaoh, and the sister of the baby who all conspired together to save Moses from uh, death by Pharaoh. And so by having Zipporah rescue Moses here from death. We have kind of bookends around the entire Moses deliverance saga. Um, he's rescued by women time and again, and these women are doing what Yahweh will later do. They're taking action in salvific ways, and they're hearing the cries of the oppressed. They're doing the right thing. It's all a really cool parallel. So, um, so I think literarily this story is essential because it closes off the deliverance saga of Moses, and it introduces the deliverance saga of the Israelites, which will stretch from here to basically to the end of the book. Um, it anticipates the circumcision that will be necessary for Passover participation, um, and, and it gets Moses' family ready for that. So I hope this has been helpful. It's a tough passage, and there's more that could be said, but I don't want to give away everything that's going to be in my commentary. I've got to save some of it for print. So I hope that you've enjoyed this, and I hope you have. A fantastic week. Mm -hmm.